Good afternoon, everyone. I think most of you don't know me. I don't know most of you, but we can get introduced ourselves. Um, essentially, we are all PE surgeons. And before I get into the sports medicine, sports medicine is a misnomer in the eastern part of you know hemisphere because in the western world, sports medicine is perceived differently, but in the eastern hemisphere, it is perceived differently. This is not for donies and colies alone. So that is that is the information that we need to get it very spot on in the early early on itself because there is a misnomer that this speciality is evolved just to treat sports and athletes but not. The idea of why it's named as sports medicine in the western world is that if you see the curriculum of our training it's like a pyramid. We are all general orthopedic surgeons trained in trauma first then later on we get our orthoplasty of doing hip replacement, knee replacement, shoulder. We don't have much other replacement apart from hip and knee in this country. We don't do much shoulders, elbow, ankle, wrist and thumbs. But those training comes through the second tire and the third tire comes through pediatrics, spines, foot and ankle and other subspeciality of orthopedics. Then the last one is sports medicine because the sports medicine is something very unique because from a dexterity point of view, from a skill point of view, it's very difficult to climb up the ladder because you are doing everything in a very you know, sleek manner to the highest precision. And the important aspect of why the sports medicine has evolved is we are not treating symptoms. We are not aiming for symptom resolution. What we are aiming is to return to activity. Not, nothing is 100%. It's like glass. We all agree that. But trying to get 95, 97, high 90 success rate in restoring the activity so, for patients to be served under sports medicine, they, it's not about affordability, it's about their mindset. They need to have a quality of life, they need to look, they need to have an injury or a disease, and they need to have a deficiency in their quality of life, they need to appreciate it, and then we put them back on track. So this is not like a Tom, Dick and Harry doing knee replacements or hip replacements or doing fixing fractures or anything, it's not because it is a very subset where the clinician is also picked up by the system who are very good in doing what they are supposed to do and the patients themselves needs to be good in anticipating what they expect. The problem why I said that this, the name itself is misnomer and the cohort of patients that I can serve is very very small proportion. So with that hindsight we will go to that. What is sports medicine? Sports medicine is by definition it's a subspecialty you know, of both medical and orthopedic speciality whereby it deals with anything to do with activity. It doesn't need to be a track and field or a field sports. It can be a, you know, a normal weekend warrior going for a walk with his friend or playing you know, whatever sports with the grandchildren or uh, you know, next door neighbors. Essentially, the purpose is they need to get back to activity. So there should be an activity, there should be an injury, there should be a deficiency of action and we try to put that back to as normal as possible but not 100%. So the most important thing is return to activity. Now, around half of the people who does any activity, even if you go for a walk, you know, every day, 5 or 10 minutes, you are more prone to sustain around 50% injury in your lifetime at some point. So if there are 100 patients doing a simple walking for the last 10, 12 years, if you talk to them or if you have experience, you would have come over and twisted your ankle, you would have missed a step and put, you know, fall on your upstairs stands. You would have had some kind of injury. Whether it is trivial or whether it is significant, it's all to do with your, you know, the, the force that you are exerting and your, you know, osteoporosis or, you know, your bone strength and your mineral matrix strength. So essentially, you know, 50% will get an injury at some point in the life. Now, we treat a host of conditions. So, the aim of my talk today is to not to bore you about all, you know, every single condition that I can treat in, you know, from a musculoskeletal system. We treat everything, but we treat with precision. So we don't want, what I'm trying to say to you is, we don't want a patient who does not know what he's up to. We don't want somebody who broke the ankle and say that, uh, Dr. Ming, an operation, but I'm not cut the body, I'm going to do this. We want to be realistic. If he has sustained a severe injury whereby his ankle is dislocated, it will take nine months for him to get back and do what he wants to do. And he needs to have the commitment. It is not us. It is he has to, he is the driver. We are just a co-passenger. We can only guide him. We are Google Maps. 
but we will, you know, without error, we will do our direction. So that mentality is very, very essential in this in this cohort of patients group. Otherwise, you know, this will muddy the water. So we we'll manage, you know, any conditions in anywhere. But I'm going to concentrate only on two things, which I'll come to the later point. Because in India, there is no subspeciality. You know, just now we had a, um, you know, pulmonologist. I think so, but you know, I'm sure he, that will be his speciality. But if you come to the Western world, the, the pulmonologist is split into various things. Because what, the moment you say you're subspecialist into something, then your general practice gets knocked off. Then you're, you know, because the system is how the clinician, the healthcare is delivered in our country is unfortunately. You know, there is a money transaction at the point of delivery of care. There is money being transferred between a patient and a clinician at the delivery of care. That is always, you know, inherent for buyers because that is not a perfect system. But with one point, you know, with 130 billion, we don't have a choice. So we treat any musculoskeletal condition from shoulder. The predominant thing that I want to stress that is a young patient who had recurrent dislocation of shoulder who has injured his labrum. That surgery or that condition is not manageable by conservative measures. I'll come to that in a minute. 99.99% of all injuries we have to manage conservatively as a default. There are only exceptions. There are, you know, surgery is not a norm. Surgery is an except, you know, exception. Uh, unfortunately or fortunately, MHS has taught me to do, take a decision to do surgery, not in my best interest, but it's in patient's best interest which is very difficult to practice uh, in a system where we don't have a state health sponsors. So when you become a private practitioner, there is always an incentive to extra investigate and you know, have a low threshold to say surgery. That is inborn error, which very easy to say here with a 16 years of NHS and 14 years of you know, uh, NHS pension. But if I don't have that glamour or if I don't have that backup, uh, it's very difficult. So shoulder, we want to concentrate on labral injuries, but we will treat, you know, I'm sure as general practitioners, you would have found, you know, come across tennis elbow and golfer's elbow. These are all age-related wear and tear changes. So I'm not concentrating on that. I've just put it on the screen. But in the labral injuries that I told you, if you give me a labral tear guy, I can, I can't give you a 100% guarantee, but I'll give you 97, 98% that he, I will make him to go and do what he wants to do in your life. I, you know, we have treated weight lifters, we have treated, you know, uh, pole wall, you know, all over athletes. So that disease or that injury is predictable pathology. So you can predict the outcome. Uh, others are not predictable. So that's why the success rate is somewhere in the 70s and 80s. Now, in the lower limbs, similarly, there is most of conditions that we treat right from hip to the big toe. But the ACL injury in the knee is again a predictable injury. But it is uncontrary to that. So if you give me 100 labral tear injuries in the shoulder, I'll operate on 99. If you give me 100 ACLs, rupture in the knee, I won't operate on 99. Because if the patient is very, you know, if he can recruit his quadriceps muscle, which is a secondary stabilizer for valgus restraint, which is what the ACL is, and anterior translation, he can, if I sustain an injury today while going down the stairs, and if I rupture my ACL, I will not have surgery because I know how to recruit my quadriceps. So if the patient can recruit the quadriceps, he doesn't need surgery. But there is one proportion who needs surgery straight away. Those are the people who play high level sports and high level activity. I'm not talking about weekend warriors or you know, who do an amateur sport. I'm talking about who earns because of sports. So somebody's revenue needs to be affected so that we can return to his activity. Say for example, in English Premier League footballers, we can't tell him nine months of rehab, you can't get into the track because his club will throw him out and he will lose his million pound contract, then he's useless. So we will try and put him back on track so that he can make some economic justification, but there is a price to pay. He will get arthritis in the knee much better than a guy who hasn't had an ACL reconstruction done and he has recruited his quadriceps by active physiotherapy. So the, the point is, two conditions that I want to concentrate labral injuries in shoulder, where it is an operation of necessity, there is no choice there. If I dislocate my shoulder at this age, and if I have sustained a labral injury, it is, it is the rim of your, you know, in your saucer. The cup can't stay there. The, the head of the humerus can't stay if the labrum is not intact 360 degrees. So that, that is non-negotiable. 
but for the ACL it's the opposite. The ACL is more prevalent and the incidence is more, but more operations are done when it is not necessary. Now, I'm sure you all investigated musculoskeletal injuries, but the specific investigation that we are focusing is, you know, most of the time when it comes to tertiary care, they would have had an MRI scan elsewhere. But certain, these two specific injuries, and in an ACL it's okay, they have done a decent scan, you can find out. But shoulder injuries, you cannot pick up 99% of Chennai scans are 1.5 Teslas. There are only 5 or 6 scans in Chennai who has 3 Tesla scanner. So we need the 3 Tesla scanner. And it's not that, it's not about cost or anything. It's about the resolution. It's like a pixel in your phone. You want your eye to have, you know, resolution. When the brain doesn't know, the eye doesn't see. When you can't see, then the brain doesn't know. From a radiology training point of view, if they have not looked at many 3 Tesla scanner in the training in the shoulder, which I think MS Orthopedics doesn't deliver as of now. So, if a, if a radiologist has to report a shoulder MRI scan, unfortunately, at, at this point of time, he has to go outside the country and get trained and come back. We are, the, the workhorse of our investigation is MR arthrogram. So you have to have an MR arthrogram before you touch a patient. Because if they had an MRI somewhere else, and if it's confirmed the diagnosis, and if it's confirmed your clinical finding, that's fine. But the extent of injury is misleading in a normal MRI scan. So just to give you an idea, the, the labrum is a 360 degree. If you think that the labrum is gone only for, it's like a clock. If you think it's only gone from say 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock from a normal MRI, if you do an MRI arthrogram, if you distend the joint with gadolinium dye, that pad will progress to 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock. And then if you actually probe during surgery, doing arthroscopy, it will progress from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock. So the false negatives of MRI are very high. Because it changes, especially in our country it changes because for every every clock we have to use one anchor. So if an MRI says that it's only from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, so one anchor costs somewhere around 40,000, 50, 50,000. You know, if you come to Apollo, I'm sure there will be other surcharges. But using three anchors and using nine anchors, the patient will get a surprise. And especially in the current climate of how medicine is practiced in our country, it give rise to a breach in the doctor-patient relationship. So we have to be very clear before what, you know what we are going to do in our mind before we tell the patient. So my professor have told me that your operation is done, done. It's not done on the data. It's done in your bed the night before. You have to have a clear understanding where you will stand, which is right shoulder, left shoulder, where the camera will, where the stack will be, where the nurse will be, where your assistance will be, where the image intensifier, eye animation will come through. So if you don't visualize each and every case the day before, then you will have surprises. So this is the point that I'm trying to say that sports medicine is not as, it's a different, you know, it's not out of the room. It is the same thing. It's like intensive care of, uh, you know, medical practice. If you ask any intensivist, it's not rocket science, it's still ABC. You are only maintaining ABC, but to the precision. So we all know ABC, but when in a difficult patient under difficult circumstances, it's very difficult to maintain the ABC. So likewise here, in order to give a high 90 success rate, everything needs to be spot on. So this is what I tell my patient, this is what I've been taught to me, that for a successful outcome of a patient, 33% relies with the surgeon, 33% relies with the patient, 33% relies with the equipments and the rehab and the physio, the infrastructure. One person is God or nature or whatever you believe in. So what I can do is, I can get my 33% to the best of my abilities 9 out of 10 times. I am still a human, we can get it wrong, but we have to be, the aim of doing this, the why I am concentrating on the two conditions is, unless you concentrate on subspecialists, one, you will miss the boat 10 or 15 years later because the people who have taught me are not doing more than one operation. In UK, I can't do a shoulder procedure and I can't do a knee procedure. My, my trust, the hospital will not give me a license. But here is a different story. So the bottom line is, we need a MR arthrogram for shoulder injuries. Now there are treatment options. The most important thing is that the truest sense of sports medicine is 90% revolve around injury, pre injury prevention and rehabilitation. You need gait analysis, you need you know, extra investment, which is very difficult to justify in this country. But the core is not treating the injury, the core is preventing the injury. And you try and treat it non-operatively to 
the best of your abilities unless they go into our operation of necessity classes. Otherwise, non operative management. Surgery, if you, there are three, for me, there are three things. If I have to say I will operate on you, there are three conditions that I need to satisfy myself. And absolutely no gray areas in indication. It has to be a surgery until proven otherwise. It, it can't be a stretching of indications. And number two, patient should not regret at any point why he came to us. And number three, I should not regret why I touched this patient. Unless I satisfy these three criteria, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, what is the injury, where he can get operated, can he afford or can he not afford, all those things are irrelevant, but these three conditions has to be met. Indication should be that I should be happy that I have taken on a good human being. It's not patient. You need good human beings. And number three, they need to trust you and they should not regret that they have come to a wrong person at six months, one year, ten years down the line. Now, surgical options, we have, you know, we have a gantry, we have an armamentarium of surgical options, but the nitty gritty is either we do something minimally invasive, we don't do open approaches, or we do arthroscopic, which is key, which is similar to your laparoscopic one. We seldom do open procedures. Uh, the advantage of arthroscopy is similar to your laparoscopy because it's less, it's not less invasive as it says here. It's less visibly invasive. It is actually more invasive than your open surgery because at least in open surgery there are many people who can see in the theater what you are doing. But in arthroscopy and laparoscopy it is only your conscious will tell you how much damage you have done inside. And definitely it's minimal blood loss, minimal recovery time. You can do day surgeries but here are, because of the insurance and how the patient perception if you tell him that you have done a surgery for 6 lakhs and if you tell him that you can go at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I think the perception differs here. Now the common means is what I want to concentrate, you know, the selling point is why I have come here and, you know, the take home message for you is ACL injuries are the most common knee injuries. You have meniscal injuries and other injuries, but they are all very common, but I am not talking, the meniscal injury, there is a misnomer. Meniscal injury is a sign of arthritis above 40 years. We, they are not true meniscal injuries. I am talking about the non-degenerative meniscal injury which is purely because of trauma. I am not talking about degenerative wear and tear meniscal tear. I can tell you 90% of this how if you do an MRI scan including my scan, me, I will have a meniscal tear. But those are not, those, does, those doesn't warrant any treatment. Now, ACL rupture happens because of pivoting injury, what we call it as. So, you have to plant your foot in one direction and change your body into another direction. That's the time it snaps. There are various types, uh, you know, I don't think so, it's for us to discuss today. The treatment options is, as I said, default. If you just give me 100 ACLs in a room, I can tell you 97, 98, I'll send them back to physio and rehab. Because the clear indication is, you know, it's a tip of an iceberg. We can only they are genuinely needed to be operated only in a minuscule of what is happening, not only in this country, including the Western world, it is oversell. Uh, there is one thing that is not available in our country, I think, so widely. Not all ACL needs to be reconstructed. If it comes from the femoral footprint with a good 11 millimeter stump, we can actually repair the native ACL. We don't need to reconstruct it. We don't need to take a hamstring graft. We don't need to shave the, his own native ACL because there is a difference between ACL reconstruction and ACL repair. The ACL reconstruction that what we do doesn't have pessinine corpuscules and the proprioceptive receptors. But if you repair an ACL repair, uh, then you retain the proprioceptive functions. Now shoulder, it's a very under, under educated um, speciality in our country, unfortunately, because as I said, I think so the MS orthopedics doesn't cover this into the curriculum. Maybe now they are slowly catching up. There are a lot of courses and a lot, lot of workshops. But per se, the, the teaching in shoulder conditions are, you know, I think the most common condition which I've learned from after coming here is periarthritis shoulder. Uh, I'm not sure about the exact definition of it. That's, you know, the adhesive capsulitis, which is frozen shoulder. But there are much more subtle shoulder conditions that can be treated with precision. But the one that I want to concentrate is the lateral injury, which is what it is. It is nothing but a stop, you know, it stops your humeral leg from dislocating from glenoid. Now the treatment options again, 
If you give me 100 laminar tags, I'll operate more than 90. It's not that because I want to earn, because they have they should not be degenerative. You know, if if somebody more than 45, 50, they'll not get an operation from me. They'll not even get a scan from me. Now I put the bottom slide there with the different types of arthroplasty in shoulder. Now there is I talk about other replacement as well. There is much, you know, there is so much hip and knee. It, it looks like if somebody had a knee arthritis, they need to have a knee replacement. If somebody had a hip arthritis, they need to have a hip replacement. It is not. It is not an operation. It is just like a paracetamol. It's like just like your diclofenac. It's just like your physiotherapy. It's just like your you know uh, knee socks or knee stockiness. It is an option for the patient. It is. Not, it is not that if somebody's got a grade four arthritis with tibia kicking on femur, I can see a perception that no, this is too bad. We need to have a knee replacement. No, it's not. The only two reasons to have a knee replacement is night pain and nine out of ten daily activities the patient should suffer and feel that they want to have the knee amputated. So they, it is that symptom that decides the knee replacement. It is not the X-ray finding or not the doctor. I can't decide which knee needs to be replaced and which knee not to be replaced. It is a patient who decides. We have different options for knee replacement as well. You, know, you don't need to knee, replace the entire uh, joint. You can do a partial knee replacement. Uh, we, we can actually replace many other things like hip, ankle, elbow, wrist, thumb, everything. But there, these indications are very small. And it will be very difficult for me to convince our patient's group to justify this. But if there are subsets, then we can do it. But we can't do it just for the sake of doing it. Now, the take-home message is we can need more orthopedic conditions, but that's not the agenda. The agenda is to promote that any, you know, we will deliver more than expected results in shoulder lateral tears and knee ACL injuries. <coughs> because the key is patient selection and return to activity. I'm sure this is a well-known philosophy for us, but in the heat of the time, this gets, as the previous speaker was telling, because of the work pressure or the you know the number of patients or other thing, you know we can't compromise quality because as he rightly alluded, patients will watch you. Patients will watch you because the the effort that you put in examining and diagnosing and explaining to the you know the patient, they will form an opinion, and that opinion stays there. So. We can choose to see whether 100 patients or 10 patients, but we have to choose the right patients, but we have to be faithful to the patients whom we are choosing. So with that note, thank you very much. Any questions? Vastus medialis, 
intermediates, lateralis, and all the four quads, if they can recruit and stretch the hamstring, I bet you, if you rupture it, and if I teach you, it's spending time with the patient. If I teach you, in nine months, I'll make sure that you're not having the lachman test, the instability. But if you want, he has to think it is his problem and I am there to help him. And the understanding is very important. If you go to the hospital, you will He has to work hard. He has to sweat. And the commitment is not enough. If you go to the UK, you will go to the But 
the science is the ability to pick up on a three tesla with an mr arthrogram is much more than a standard mr if a radiologist is good enough to pick you know pick it up in 1.5 you know it is his talent it's not about anybody else so that's number one in terms of nhs waiting time for three tesla you are right for elective cases but for M, for urgent cases if a 21 year old comes up with a dislocation of shoulder that's why so it is right it is about you know the resources are pointed to the need if you have a degenerative condition you will wait for more than 3 months for a 3 tesla scan but if you come off the bike and dislocate your shoulder it will happen instantaneously but it's a different system so we can you know compare apples for oranges i agree with the limited resources or with the see as rightly said the consultation will be charged if the consultation is charged 500 dollars it doesn't matter we have all the time for him to come and talk to us but here it is whatever it's few hundred pound 100 rupees so it, we have to factor that in Sorry, this is the training. What he said is correct. The training. What we do is whenever whatever this uh, ultrasound tears, my sorry, labral tears are there, we will go to arthroscopy room and then we will teach the students the, how the tear is there, what the three to six six o'clock position it is there, or extending that one. So the training is very very important. That is what we are doing it in our institution. Thank you.